years past, all these hilltops had all kinds of Dakota skippers. But about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the, the skippers disappeared through most of Minnesota. And there's not a lot known about why that happened. These butterflies have disappeared from most of their range, gone from at least three-fourths of what we know. Um, and they're really good indicators of, of problems on the prairie themselves in general. They are the most endangered ecosystem in North America, though. Only 1% of it is remaining. That's a big loss. The Dakota skipper is a federally threatened and Minnesota endangered butterfly. It's one of the rarest pollinators that we have in the state. So it's really important that we do everything that we can to conserve them and keep their populations going. The disappearance of these butterflies is probably symptomatic of many other species that are also in trouble. And so if we can learn what it takes to make good prairie and bring these species back, it's going to be helping us bring lots of other things back as well. Without the habitat, we don't have any chance of, of bringing the Dakota skipper back. We know that this was preferred habitat for them at one time, and for whatever reason they disappeared, we're trying to enhance the habitat so that they can be reintroduced and thrive here. We are trying to bring other institutions on board because we know we can't do it all by ourselves. Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg is just beginning to dabble in Dakota skippers as well, trying to restore some of the Canadian populations. So we refer to this as an insurance population. So unfortunately, if they were to disappear from more places in the wild, we know that we'll always have a small population here at the Minnesota Zoo. And then we're able to leverage that to begin doing these types of reintroductions and get them back out into the landscapes that they otherwise had disappeared from. I very much believe in trying to reestablish and maintain those connections. Even if it's not always apparent what that connection is, it is a piece of earth and a piece of our history that if it's lost, the world becomes a smaller and lonelier place. Part of our mission in state parks is to manage and reintroduce rare species where we can. So about six, seven years ago, we started working with Minnesota Zoo staff to see if they were interested in bringing Dakota skippers back here to Glacial Lakes State Park. Glacial Lakes contains many of the historic pieces of prairie and characteristics of prairie that have largely been lost. It retains the floral diversity, it has the grassland birds and the really kind of those iconic features of prairie that are largely gone, including the habitat for these skippers. More than 18 million acres of the state used to be prairie, and we only have about one to two percent of that left, meaning that all of those unique animals and plants and other wildlife that rely on that habitat have also declined. We chose to enter into a partnership with the Minnesota Zoo where they will do the butterfly work, they'll rear, they'll bring them out here. And our part of the partnership was to make sure our habitat was as good as we could make it in the time that we had. So to prepare for the reintroduction of the Dakota skipper, we have done some habitat enhancement projects at the sites where the skippers will be released. Some of the things we've done are cleaning up the vegetation, removing woody stemmed vegetation near the release sites, and we've planted a lot of native prairie flowers that the Dakota skipper uses as nectar sources and larval host plants. The Dakota skipper needs to have echinacea, purple cone flower, and there's a lot of purple cone flower here at Glacial Lakes. We want them back out in this community, and we think that this community of plants and insects and those interactions are what's going to support the Dakota skippers. It has all the pieces. <laughs> And we've been really lucky um, with this partnership between the Minnesota Zoo and, and the state parks uh, to be able to help enhance that even further. So here at the Minnesota Zoo, we are managing our conservation program for Dakota skippers. And out here, we have a lot of action happening where on this side of the table, we've got caterpillars and pupa. And on this side, we've got breeding cages for our Dakota skippers. On the inside of the lab, we also then have a bunch of other pupa that are being prepared for these operations either here or to be released. 
at Glacial Lakes State Park. Our strategy here at the Minnesota Zoo is to get them through their really sensitive larval stages, keep them protected from predators, diseases, and all those other threats that they would be facing out in the Minnesota prairies until they reach their adult stage. That, at that point, then they can be released. But that can't be all there is to the conservation of these butterflies. We're not doing this so that we have a population indefinitely here at the Minnesota Zoo. The goal is eventually to get them back out in the landscape, participating with that ecosystem and doing what Dakota skippers and other pollinating insects do. Well, as a zoo, we don't manage land. So that's why we need to bring in additional partners to complete that conservation cycle. So the prairie restoration process is somewhat complex. It starts with seed collection. We typically hand pick it, but we also use tools like the combine. We'll bring it to a place where we can clean it, dry it, repackage it, and then bring it back to its original location or as close to that original location as possible, i.e. the state parks, and seed it with what you're seeing behind me. A lot of invasive species control, mowing, mulching, getting rid of the sumac, buckthorn, honeysuckle. Prescribed burning is another major part of our job in the prairie restoration process. And it takes a long time, anywhere from a decade and beyond in some locations. It's a constant battle. The final thing that we're just starting to do here at Glacial, which has direct benefit for the skippers, is we're using um, neighboring cattle as grazers for us. And grazing will stimulate the prairie. Um, it'll stimulate the flowers, the seed production. With this size of, of land, it takes a lot of cows to mimic the buffalo. Uh, so we have about 118 cows out here. It wouldn't work with just 20 cows. Graze it, get off of it, let it recover then. We're seeing a, a rejuvenation of the purple cone flowers where the grazers have been. It's definitely a win-win situation for us and, and the park system. For us, it allows us to get across more acres. The more acres we are able to graze in a year, the more we can let everything have an appropriate amount of rest time. This is actually the first time we've grazed in the spring. The last couple years we did late fall grazes. Both work well for you know, what the goal for the land is. In the fall, everything has made their seed for the year. So then the cows are out there, they're really stomping seed into the ground. So you get a lot of new regrowth the next spring from that seed. When you graze in the spring, like we are now, the goal is to, to inhibit the brome grass from going to seed. With the grazers um, in the critical habitat, I think we've got a, hopefully a winning situation for those Dakota skippers as they arrive. So here at Glacial Lake State Park, we've chosen three initial release stations that we're putting the butterflies at. So when we see the butterflies disperse, we kind of know relatively what areas they started out from. And of course, the end goal is that the whole 2,000 acres of continual grassland is occupied by the Dakota skippers. We're both releasing adult butterflies that have emerged from the Minnesota Zoo that we're bringing out. And then we're also bringing out them as in, in the pupa stage, which is what this little station right here is, where the butterflies then are allowed to eclose or emerge from their pupa stage as adults right here at the site and can self-release right outside of the box. We've just chosen three strategic locations to set up our releases at. And that just involves picking them up with a paintbrush and setting them on some of their favorite nectar plants and then letting them go. At that point, they've now graduated. They're on their own and they are responsible for keeping the species going. This is a huge partnership. So yes, our role here might be in the propagation and breeding of the Dakota skippers, but it's also relying on other experts, land managers like the Nature Conservancy, 
and with the DNR, but this also includes bringing other partners at the federal level, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and much of this has been funded through the Environment and Resources Natural Trust Fund that's made all of this research and important conservation work possible. Our goal is to put ourselves out of a job. If we are so successful at Dakota Skippers that we can move on, I will be thrilled with that because then we, we've checked something off, we've brought back a piece of that historic legacy that is, is largely disappearing from us. We're starting to learn so much. In a really short period of time, we've been able to create a lot of hope. By studying the butterflies and understanding their needs, we're starting to be able to piece together what a future for the Dakota Skipper is going to look like. That's why I get up in the morning and that's why I have hope that there is going to be a future for the Dakota Skippers here in Minnesota. I am motivated to try to bring those lost pieces back. Sometimes conservation is hard because we see the problems all around us, but we also have to be optimists as conservation biologists. This is a huge research effort. So in the short term, so long as we're learning about these species, so long as we're able to create new plans to put together and be able to understand what the needs of the butterflies are, that is winning for the species right now.